Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Russ, and today we have two amazing guests to introduce to you now. Brad and Maggie Jones are directors and producers with several decades of combined experience. Maggie is a stage four cancer thriver who credits metabolic therapies, along with conventional treatment, with miraculously prolonging her life, which she now has dedicated to raising awareness of metabolic therapies for cancer. She has over 20 years of high-level media experience. Brad Jones has over 20 years of editing experience and has worked on everything from a Peabody award-winning documentary to the highest rated shows ever recorded on MTV and CMT and spent over a decade working at the, at the Sundance Film Festival and Institute. They have both poured their hearts and souls into making the documentary Cancer Evolution, which relates advances in cancer research from the 1920s to the present, as told by the original researchers, their biographers, and contemporaries. The documentary will debut sometime in 2023 and, and feature several of our former guests, including Dr. Thomas Seyfried, Travis Christofferson, Martha Tettenborn, and Sam Apple, among others. Brad and Maggie, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Casey, it's such a pleasure. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you both so very much for what you guys are doing. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart after watching my mom suffer through cancer and eventually after seven and a half years of terrible treatments, terrible diet advice, just not do very well and have that again end very poorly for her. That was almost 20 years ago and it's just been something that's been so um, so much of a passion in my own life to be able to share and I know it's such a passion yours and I really meant it when I said you guys poured your heart and soul into this documentary. I have haven't seen the full finished product, but everything that I've seen so far is absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I'm so sorry about your story, but so inspired by how it's helped, led you to help others. I've loved your podcast and some of your previous guests, and I know you're making a giant impact an inspiration well, for us and what we want to do. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you uh, so much. I really appreciate your work. I, I was just, I, I think I was maybe telling this to Dr. Seyfried when he asked, but um, when my mom was going through chemotherapy treatments, we would stop by a Starbucks around here in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, most people in Salt Lake don't drink coffee because of the Mormon heritage around here, but we would get a giant venti sized um, apple cider hot drink, which was her favorite thing to drink. And we would bring it to her at the hospital while she was getting treatments and and looking up the nutrition fact afterwards it was like at least 70 grams of of like straight up sugar liquefied sugar that we would give to her during her treatment ridiculous yeah it, yeah yeah no, go ahead oh I, I was hoping you would. Uh, it's tragic really i think and having been personally in so many chemotherapy infusion rooms i never did infusion myself but i've been there and i have many close friends that have sodas and sure your you know snacks everywhere in fact when i just go get a scan or get my blood work taken it's always trying to offer me an orange juice or a snack and and i, I have actually tried to mention a few occasions that you know Hey, you guys know why PET scan works, right? It's because the tumor takes up sugar. These are nothing but sugar, but but there's nothing. And there is a big desire to just console the poor cancer victim at that point and to help them live the best life and to want to give them what you think is best. And that's what we really need to change, I think, is what is best and what really is consoling somebody and helping them, or at least giving them the option. I always make a very big deal that, you know, these treatments, the therapies, the metabolic therapies can be hard in their own way. If someone chooses not to pursue them, that's fine as long as they know it's an option, as long as they've seen the research and the survival statistics, and then they can make their own decision with no judgment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I think that's so important, and, and you guys making this film, I think, is going to be such a great leap in the right direction. Before we talk about your story, especially you, Maggie, I want to talk about both of you guys. How did you meet? What was your life like before the cancer diagnosis? Oh, this is a great one for Brad. Um, well, we met in Los Angeles. We both used to, now we live in Seattle, but um, yeah, we, uh, she's a lifelong LA, uh, LAer, and uh, I moved there uh, just after college and was working in the entertainment industry. And I just had a roommate that uh, invited Maggie over one day. She came over with a boyfriend at the time, actually. <laughs> and uh, there was a, actually, there was like an immediate connection, but I just sort of removed myself from the situation because I was like, this is just torturous. <laughs> but I went home to my live in boyfriend and told him that night. 
night that, you know, if I were ever single and that guy, Brad, <laughs> he's not too bad. And seriously, the next two weeks later, I think it's I was fun, single. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's a great so, yeah. story. I love it. She came over for a party and she was single and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's Started awesome. Dating right away. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys, and you guys continued working in the film industry, correct? Correct. <laughs> He did. I worked in media, so I started with just websites, which has been really helpful with this film also, and then rose to project management, and then eventually was vice president at the LA Times, Tribune Publishing, and got recruited to the South China Morning Post, which is how we ended up in Hong Kong, which is the beginning of my next story. <laughs> and Brad continues in media. <laughs> Or, you know, bitten. Yeah, so, I mean, my uh, my sort of um, best-known credits were uh, I was the supervising editor on the Jersey Shore for uh, a few seasons. And then uh, there was also a show on the country music television that was – it was the number one show on that um, network that I was an editor for as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had, I really enjoyed working in, uh, in media. And I did do some documentary work as well. Um, there was a – a documentary called Walmart, the high cost of low price that came out a long time ago, maybe like 20 years ago. And I worked on that. And um, so, yeah, when we had this idea of doing a documentary about this topic, we were really just well positioned. Maggie's a project manager. I was an editor. So, you know, we just really put put our uh, you know talents together to to make something great. Wow, that's, wow amazing. that's amazing. I remember watching the scenes that actually made it into Jersey Shore. I can't imagine yeah. what you would have had to watch in all the scenes that didn't make it onto Jersey Shore. <laughs> that must have been uh, shocking to say the least. <laughs> there was some, there was some, uh, some fun stuff. I, I, you know, there are some NDAs that are still in effect, so I can't, <laughs> I can't quite go into too much detail. But yeah, there was definitely some stuff that uh, that didn't make it in. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Okay, so tell us, um, you know. What it was like to live in Hong Kong, where you did get the diagnosis of cancer. Is that correct? That's correct. So we were ready for a change. Well, we've been living in LA together. We bought our first house and fixed it up uh, for about 10 years when I was getting antsy and I think Brad too for the next chapter. And I got this offer for Hong Kong and we ended up moving in 2018, exactly one week before my 40th birthday. And it was exactly one month later to the day, I believe, that I would receive my diagnosis and it was terminal. Uh, stage four lung cancer that had spread to the brain by then, the eye, so many lymph nodes throughout my neck, chest, abdomen. It, uh, you know, it, it couldn't, it was unresectable, incurable. The doctors gave me six to eight months to live. And at the time, I thought, you know, I, I was sad, but all I wanted was to be a good patient. And I wanted to make Brad proud of me and my doctors proud of me. And about that lasted about four or five days, <laughs> and I started reading. And even though the survival rate for my particular cancer is less than 1%, which means that it rounds to zero, I knew that meant that there were people out there who had survived. And even if there's one, I knew I could be one of those people. And so it was, I was diagnosed officially on a Tuesday, and on Sunday is when I started my first fast. <laughs> And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was following the books that I was reading. And over time, I read more and more, and I got more familiar with the work of some of your wonderful guests like Seyfried and Travis and Miriam Clement Lamium, and continued to craft my own view of metabolic health that worked really, really well for me. And literally a year later, it was my fourth scan since being diagnosed, I was cancer free. And uh, since then, I've been amazing. The only real issue is because I had, uh, and I would, you know, not saying this is a bad thing, but the results of my conventional treatment included stereotactic radio surgery. So the four tumors that were in my brain eventually became necrotic. And so that's essentially gangrene in my brain right now. And it does cause some neurological issues. The only one that's so noticeable that you'll notice here is my voice. So I have some aphasia that makes speaking difficult, but Brad's here for that. <laughs> Yes. Wow. What an incredible and, yeah, story. The, what an incredible story. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so blessed. And most of the therapies that we followed, we still follow to this day. But the one thing, you know, I worked all through my 
treatment and my cancer, but it was only after I was no evidence of disease that I finally went to my boss and said, I have to stop. I have to quit and I have to focus on my health. Yeah. And wow. then, uh, well, I actually just, you know, in this period, there's, there's two things I would say. One is Maggie's favorite joke. Now when anything goes wrong is, well, I have brain damage. <laughs> so she likes to, <laughs> Excuse. Yeah, she use that. Use that for the rest of your life. That's great. Yeah, I yeah. I think I was perfect to begin with either, <laughs> but at least now I have the excuse. <laughs> Um, and the other thing I was going to say that, um, that, that, that she reminded me of was um, the fasting. Um, she had the radio, brain radio surgery, the um, radiation, twice. The first time was like right away. They just like, you know, kind of rushed her in, what was it, like a week or two after her diagnosis, I think. Pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. It's less than a month. It was pretty quickly. So um, that round of, of radiation she was in bed just getting sick for you know and i was like wow this is our this is our future basically i was like i don't know if this is you know how we're going to get out of this um that's kind of how i was thinking at the time um and then she ended up having a second round of radio surgery and this time she had learned about this what two or three months later uh let's see so the first radio surgery was in november and the second was in april okay so a few months later um but by, by then she had learned about these metabolic therapies and she fasted for about 72 hours before she went in for the second uh radio surgery and which is just radiation it's not really surgery right it, as opposed to whole brain radiation where you have to have multiple sessions this is a very intense round for the two tumors at the time yeah um but yeah they call it like a, a radio radio knife radio. even so yeah, yeah they, knife. they call it surgery even though it's not really surgery anyway <laughs> so um but yeah so she came out of this uh, second round of radiation and she went to work like within a couple of days. I walked back from the hospital. I felt great. <laughs> that was yeah. on a Friday, went to work on Monday. And the only difference really was, was fasting. Yeah. And that's slightly different diet for the previous six months, I yeah. suppose. I was just amazed at how that just three days of fasting basically ch changed her from like laying in bed for like over a week. That from Three the first weeks one. of just sweating, vomiting yeah. on the couch, couldn't get to the bed actually. Yeah. So, on oxygen Ugh. yeah i mean and that's a really easy one that you know like basically just just didn't eat for a few days yeah wow <laughs> that's incredible i just i what i am familiar with as far as cancer goes is the it's very similar to the first treatment what you had to go through nausea horrible pain i'm not coming out of the bedroom for two or three days like you kind of the kids have to kind of sort out dinner on their own that's what i'm familiar with because we were on the healthy diet of low fat standard american diet lots of skim milk and twizzlers and all those things we talked about earlier so that is amazing yeah. to hear about the fasting i do want to go back to the diagnosis and again having a front row seat i was able to see my mom suffer which was hard and she took it and she did you know relatively well with it but it was also really shocking to me to see my dad suffer through it he wasn't going Going through the disease but he was the one supporting the person going through the disease and and in some ways that's almost like like worse it's terrible and to it's see so much my, worse it's terrible yeah my dad a grown-ass man the man i respect breaking down and bawling in tears and like it, it's such a hard burden so i want to ask both of you what what were your each of your reactions to the diagnosis I mean, for me, I always knew that the caregiver role would be more difficult because I would die <laughs> and he's left behind without me and life without me is just horrible. <laughs> uh, you, you joke. I, I don't know. I, I, I felt like she had the harder role, right? I mean, I was just there and just trying to support her, just do whatever I could. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I definitely was bawling my eyes out as well, but not in front of her, like trying to, you know, like make sure she didn't see that um, and just trying to be strong when I was in front of her. And yeah, I mean, it is it. It's certainly not anything you would ever wish on anyone. Um, but yeah, I just had to do what we needed to to get through it and uh i'm just really lucky that she she was the one that was like looking at uh finding all this research and she would just you know bring it to me not for me to like sign off on it but just sort of like this is where i'm coming from this is what I've, i'm finding um 
And that's like something that people ask us a lot of times. It's like, well, why did you let your wife like do all this stuff? And I'm like, well, it's her first, it's her life, right? Like she can do whatever she wants with it. Um, and second, like, yeah, she was making an informed decision and that's all I really wanted. I was like, Hey, if you're going to do this, just make sure it's not like some crazy thing that you found on the internet. Right. And that was it. And she was like, she was just reading book after book, you know, uh, like, um, paper after paper, you know, looking at, uh, there's some small, not really like trials, but there's, um, some, certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence and just some, um, what's that called? Just papers. Pilot studies. Yes. Pilot studies. studies. Thank you. Yeah. Some case studies. So, you know, this is, um, there's a lot of scientific evidence behind this. I mean, quite a bit. So, um, you know, it's, you can't just dismiss this out of hand as not being scientific. And so, yeah, she was bringing it to me and I was like, Hey, if that's the route you want to go, let's try it. Let's do it. And actually after she started doing the ketogenic diet, um, like a month or so after she started, I mean, I'm just lazy, like a lot of guys. And so I was like, you know, I'll just try eating whatever you're eating. So I, you know, just started, I lost like 40 pounds, like just being on the keto diet with her. There are wow. two ways that Brad saved my life, I think. And the first is he trusted me completely. And I know that's hard. I have a website. I do a lot of coaching for other cancer sufferers, not quite thrivers yet. And they're interested in this way of life, but their spouse or their significant other just doesn't support them. They try to feed them rice or give them the insure or do what the MDs say because they don't trust the research or they haven't had time to read it all. And Brad just never questioned me. He knew that this is what I was going to do. And I sent him out on wild goose cases in the Hong Kong to find organic foxy oil, whatever it was. And the second thing that he did for me was just never treated me like I was dying. And I wanted to be, I wanted people to know I was suffering and I wanted to have a big fuss made out, you know, my last few days, whatever it is. And Brad just kept treating me like a normal, healthy person. And eventually I saw myself as that normal, healthy person. And pretty soon I was that person. Wow. Not necessarily normal, but yeah. <laughs> healthy. Wow. 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 Yeah. Well, kudos to you, Brad, for being such a strong support during that time. That's really wonderful to hear oh, yeah. both of your perspectives. And, and I know you'll look back and say, oh, it wasn't a big deal. We just did what we had to do to get through it. But in different situations, that would have gone very differently. Maggie, going back to you and the research that you did, if I hear that somebody is going to do some research about cancer, that's one thing, right? Like you might end up in who knows what rabbit hole online. How was it you were able to find what I would consider the correct information about cancer and and the difference between you know the way we deal with cancer and maybe the way we should be dealing with cancer casey this is such a good point <laughs> and i'm incredibly blessed that my background is you know in in media and journalism to understand and evaluate different sources and also i've always had an interest in science and nutrition so my search filter you know first of all was correctly set up to give me information pubmed is my go-to source for anything and I understood some of the research, you know, at the time, it was a lot of having to read these original papers, the molecular processes, whatever. But then I found some really great summaries of that in books like Travis's, Safe Reads, all these other heroes that we've mentioned. But yes, there's a huge danger, I think, in going to Facebook <laughs> and just going with the first result that you see or YouTube or any other place that runs on an algorithm like that. So I really strongly recommend to folks to, to understand a little bit about evaluating sources, especially these days, and see if you can get it from a scientific source. But honestly, there, you also have to say, on the other hand, there's a lot of concern about who's funding some of this research and biases that take place there. And so give the appropriate amount of credit to anecdotal evidence and maybe things that haven't gone through their you know $2 billion worth of three-stage trials, things like that. Yeah. I was like, you actually reminded me, we had people that wanted to give us money for the documentary and, but then they wanted to have certain people be interviewed or have certain points of view injected into the film. And we just said, no, um, we're just, you know, 
are we desperate for money? Kind of, but not that desperate. <laughs> oh, how that's fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, again, it's just such an amazing story. So let's let's talk a little bit about the basics of the things that you were learning. Maybe if somebody hasn't listened to our episode of Travis or Dr. Seyfried or Martha or Sam Apple, all those people that we mentioned, can you tell us a little bit about how cancer works, the things you were learning, and how nutrition is related to cancer and cancer growth? All right, you jump in if I need help. But the number one first thing I learned is that 80 to 90% of cancers, late stage cancers are fed by glucose. And this is a simple fact. You go, the golden standard diagnostic for cancer is a PET scan, right? This is how much sugar are your tumors taking up? That's because the more advanced cancers take up more sugar. So it seemed obvious to me to cut that out. Uh, down the line, I learned about the impact of glut glutamine. And I'm going to say something very controversial here for keto. These days, I strongly believe in individual nutrition, nutrigenomics, stuff like that. But at the same time, I was doing very deep ketosis with a glucose ketone index of one to two. I was also vegan. And the name of my handle of all my uh, socials for a long time was mostly vegan keto. And oh, wow. there are... Uh, hundreds, thousands of us who do it this way. And people say you can't do both, but you can. And for me, the important part was I was raised vegetarian. I know that metabolically, I don't do well with animal products, um, you know, dairy and eggs. I, in fact, I always ate eggs and some mostly vegan. <laughs> so I ate eggs and fatty fish, but dairy for me, I find inflammatory. And the fact is it's a fluid that's created by a large animal to help its large children grow even larger quickly, <laughs> which for a disease of uncontrolled growth isn't optimal for me. So there is uh, no dairy. And yeah, that's a, uh, that was number one. And that's naturally a low glutamine diet. And from there, I found, you know, care oncology clinic at the time, there's now Meekin metabolic clinic. There's lots of actual clinics that prescribe an off label drug protocol, which these are drugs that have been proven safe and effective to treat other uh, illnesses like, uh, or chronic diseases like diabetes or uh, high blood uh, cholesterol. But they basically, most of these off label drugs just help lower your blood sugar. Well, so they also block other metabolic pathways, or, like yes. a statin will block your tumor from being able to you know, metabolize fatty acids, things like that. So I started taking advantage of all these off-label drugs, in addition to supplements that are more widely available. And um, those are really the three prongs of the documentary is a ketogenic diet, a you know therapeutic ketogenic diet, which isn't just bacon and cheese, uh, fasting Excellent. and off-label drugs. Yeah. But there's so much wow. more. There's stuff like hyperbaric oxygen. There's intravenous vitamin C, sauna therapy. It, there's so much. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. The fast. I think the fasting. I would credit it's with a lot of it. Like we, she still does like a sort of a two day fast, like a day and a half fast, like every every week. And um, like actually, just even a few months ago, she's lucky enough that she has some tumor markers that pretty closely fall. I know like a lot of cancers, the tumor markers are not accurate, but Maggie's very lucky that her tumor markers are. And so she had got some tumor markers from a blood test and she's like, you know, they kind of spiked a little bit. She's like, I'm just gonna, you know, like not eat anything for a few days. She and went in, normal. yeah, she went in like two weeks later and those tumor markers had dropped. And I was just like, wow, that's just, she, this fact that she has like control of that is huge, right? So one thing, oh, one other thing I was gonna add really quickly, she's really modest. She has a blog that's called Cancer V dot me so the word cancer the letter v dot m e and it's an actually a really good resource she wrote it while she was going through everything and like finding this stuff and um it's, i think it's a really good resource for somebody if they're just starting out like either just got diagnosed or you're a caregiver you know looking for you know where to start and she mentions all the books that we're talking about and she has like little small blog posts that are like digestible so um i really think it's a good resource for somebody who's looking for more information on this yeah and wow. this was really the beginning of our mission i think is i wanted to just, first it was to inform my family of my treatment but then it grew up and said oh my gosh this research people don't know about it and getting no, more and more known in my community of how people can help themselves and then i started a little bit of 
coaching, got my nutrition degree, and I realized I just can't do it all one-on-one -on -one like this. Uh, we're not reaching people. So often you're sick and you don't have time to read a research paper or even my summary of a research paper. And that's when Brad had the incredible idea to get this out to people in a more digestible format. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Now the blog, it sounds, that sounds very interesting. We'll make sure we link that in the show notes. Was it capturing you learning this stuff like chronologically over time? The first year it really is because I was writing mostly for my friends and family. Like, oh my gosh, did you know about this? But as more and more people found it for their own cancers, it really grew into a, a broader uh, sharing of research papers that I found, recipes for how I can eat this way. It's just the stuff that's a little bit more actionable for people. Yeah. Like, wow. you know, the, how to even use like a, you know, a, a blood ketone meter, right? And how to like to do that calculation to figure out what your ketones are. I mean, just sort of simple stuff. Things that impact yeah. your blood sugar and ketones, which there are some surprising ones that that are small cases that aren't talked about in some of these books. And this is my passion. It's not something that we're able to cover in the documentary because we can't treat everybody one-on-one -on -one and it's such an individual process. But, you know, letting people know that this is something that's worth talking to a metabolically informed practitioner is our mission. And I'm hoping that we can release this with a database of practitioners, whether it's a metabolic uh, oncologist, a naturopathic integrative oncologist, a nutritionist, an RD, anywhere all over the world so people can find somebody to speak intelligently about these issues. Yeah. Wow. I, I'll just add one more little bit on there, um, just because it is such a, a good resource for people that are, you know, starting out um, there. She also has a um, we've been interviewing people that have used these therapies um, part to, to, you know, to help treat their own cancers. And so um, there is a small section in the actual documentary that features these people. but we really quickly figured out that it's like we can't just throw a few seconds of these people in the documentary and they have like a they everyone has a story like maggie's basically right so we started to, we just started to put them up on her youtube channel so it's just like uh we have i think we're over 30 now something like that um but just like you know people talking for like about 20 minutes like you know what their cancer was what their diagnosis was talking about what they specifically did because everyone's a little different and um i think it's really great too because there's all different kinds of cancer that are now up there so you might be able to even find somebody who has the kind of cancer that you have and hear what they did. I, you know, I mean, this is all not medical advice, but I mean, it just helps you to hear somebody who's in the same position as you, right? You need both. You need the hard science. You need the Thomas Seyfried's and you need the Travis Christopherson's to do the research and put that out there. But you also need the, the Martha Tettenborns. You need to hear what it was like to drive in Ottawa in the middle of winter to go get your treatments done and to do those 72 hour fasting protocols. And that, that that's part of the story. And that's what makes all of this so powerful. I want to go back to something you guys said about the fasting in particular, uh, something that, that Dr. Seyfried hammers home all the time. And I've heard him say it, the same thing on your show, the five minute preview that you guys have already released is that you need to understand the biology of cancer. Once you understand the biology of cancer, now you can make really good informed decisions about how you're going to to treat it. So as we've been looking at cancer as this genetic disease, we've kind of been following the genes and trying to make make sense out of what, what ended up being this gobbledygook of, of all kinds of, I don't know, letters and numbers and all kinds of stuff that don't really lead us anywhere. But, but by understanding the biology of cancer, you mentioned fasting is something that you could do, which is the first thing that I would do too. If you gave me a diagnosis of cancer today, I would go on a seven day water fast and I would keep that in my life for the rest of my life. So can you talk about why fasting is so powerful and such a powerful tool to be used alongside a ketogenic diet? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to take this one. Um, I'm kind of gotten into the science a lot <laughs> as we've been going through this process. Um, yeah, quickly, to just like, yeah, to talk about your the genetics that you mentioned, it's like they did this cancer genome atlas and they thought that they would figure out like, OK, well, this mutation causes this cancer and this mutation causes this cancer. And instead, what they found is that cancer tumors have hundreds of mutations, the same type of cancer can have, you know, like 50 mutations in one person and 
50 different mutations in another person. So this idea that you have a mutation and that's what causes a cancer, it's not really working out the way that scientists thought it would. So that's kind of why we're like, you know, maybe we need like safe read, you know, like let's take a step back, maybe look at a different way of how cancer forms. Um, so to get into the, the fasting in, in particular, uh, Walter, uh, Walter Longo with a V, Walter Longo, uh, did some really good research on, on fasting. And what he sort of found was that when you fast, your normal cells will sort of go into like a slightly hibernative type state. They're just, you know, they can tell there's no nutrients out there. They're kind of like, we got to like slow everything down. They actually start um, killing off the like less healthy, you know, normal cells. Cancer cells do not do this. Cancer cells are ravenous for glucose all the time, even if you're in ketosis. So what ends up happening is that the effectiveness of any kind of the conventional therapy that you do while you're on fasting ends up being much more effective. And that's what we think happened with Maggie's like second version of the, the radiotherapy. So what ends up happening is that your normal cells don't get affected as much so that you don't feel as bad and your cancer cells are actually even more exposed. The therapy ends up being usually either chemotherapy or radi radiation and ends up being more effective when you fasted for a few days before you go in. So, um, how about you talk about like just a just a longer term fast, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and so it's incredibly effective to help potentiate conventional therapies like chemo and radiation. But in some cases where those are not options, uh Serono Ramaka, a case study survivor from a cancer in a Frontiers in Cancer uh, magazine, she didn't have those those options, so she just went with keto and fasting. Right. So she fasts five to seven days every month and her terminal cancer, which was supposed to kill her within six months, she's now three or four and a half years yeah. cancer free. She had a 17 wow. centimeter tumor in her chest. <laughs> and if you see this girl, which you can on our YouTube, she's tiny. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And she used no conventional, I mean, this is again, this is just one person, but she just did keto and fasting because she was pregnant. Um, she didn't want to put that. She wanted to try and have the baby. And so that's how it came. That's how it originally worked out. And yeah. And uh, yeah. It, it was just palliative. It, they wouldn't, there was no option for chemotherapy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would have only been palliative chemotherapy, but still um, she was, she was pregnant at the time. So, wow. Yeah. But yeah, a that's 17 incredible. centimeter tumor, just like that's bigger than a grapefruit. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Wow. And yeah. it's so interesting. That's it, again, in that situation, you know, you couldn't use traditional treatments and it is just one situation, right? It's just one anecdote. But at this point, you've got so many people with so many different anecdotes. The evidence is just so strong that at the very least, like you guys said, this can be an adjunct. This doesn't have to be everything that you do, but you can use this to help our, our traditional treatments. Yeah. This is something that we haven't talked about previously, but I'm thinking about GBM, glioblastoma multiform, which we all know has terrible survival rate. You're talking a year, maybe two, if you're lucky, they catch it early, all of that. And I'm thinking of two cancer survivors who are featured in our film. I feel very close to both of them. One is Pablo Kelly. Uh, Seyfried actually wrote a study on him recently. He's now on eight years without conventional treatment. He turned down chemo and radiation, but his work with keto was enough to get his tumor operable. So he was able to have an operation, which wasn't a possibility for him before. And then I have a very close friend, uh, Ian, I'm not sure if we should lose his last name right now, but he also had GBM. He's surviving uh, five years. He's amazing. His wife is an incredibly supportive, great cook. He had conventional treatment early on and he's, he's wonderful. He's doing well, but like me, he's disabled by his aphasia. It was issues from the brain caused by his radiation treatment and his is a little bit more significant than mine even and I, I would never ever tell somebody not to take their conventional treatment but it's something to worth worth being aware of of the just that there are people that are beyond it, I suppose yeah um yeah I think that you're going to just sort of find that there's sort of a happy eventually there's sort of a happy medium here right where that I said um that idea of like you can fast and then maybe have 
you it, since the drugs are more effective, you could have less chemo or less radiation, right? Like you don't have to. There's this idea right now of the maximum tolerable dose, right? Like what's the maximum we can give to a patient and not kill them, basically, right? And it's like I think that that could be re. Uh, Re rethought, re you know, reassessed. So, um, and oh, one other thing I was just going to add with uh, respect to these like glioblastomas and 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 aggressive cancers, um, basically late stage cancers. There's a lot of people that are turning to the metabolic therapies because they have no alternative out there for conventional treatment, right? If you're a glioblastoma patient, you the, basically your doctor's like, sorry, you know, that's your diagnosis. You know, like we don't have anything for you, right? So right. the fact Go that there's, the yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of late stage cancers that, you know, people are going to their doctor and it's like, sorry, you know, like, we caught it too late. Your chances are super tiny. Get your four bears in order. And these are people, there's a lot of these people actually that we've spoken to. We have a ton of stage four cancer people that we've spoken to. And that's when they, they're like, well, that's not good enough. I'm going to keep looking for something else on my own. And there, here they are, four, five, ten, some, we talked to people that are actually nation winners 30 years out from a stage four cancer diagnosis. Uh, Jane McClellan, what is she, like 25 20, years 20, out? Yeah. yeah, I mean, just there are people that have really used this therapy and have extended their life, you know, a ton. And so. I think the big takeaway from that, too, is we're not trying to cure cancer, like no diet's going to cure cancer. But if it can make it manageable and something that you live with for the next 50, 60 years, I have no problem with that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, this is going to be a very loaded question. I think you guys will answer this appropriately. Travis Christopherson obviously wrote Tripping Over the Truth all about cancer. He also wrote a book called Curable, which is about all the different kind of messed up things in the medical system and how difficult it is for doctors to make decisions when they've got thousands of different procedures and thousands of different medications that they can use. So one of the things that he wrote about is the use of those off-label drugs. Later on down the road, th these drugs are off patent. So, so basically the, the pharmaceutical company isn't making nearly as much money as they were before, but there's still benefit from these types of drugs. So you guys are talking about, you guys are talking about fasting, amazing. What a cool tool and it doesn't cost any money. So that's great. You're talking about off-label drugs, incredibly cheap. This is a great resource that we can use. Maybe not all of them, but some of them we can use in targeted situations. So you guys are learning about all this. This is a wonderful, why is this not being told to more people? Let me use my oncologist as an example. <laughs> So we moved to Seattle two years ago, right after I had my first seizure in Vienna. And I went to one of the top five cancer hospitals in America. That's why we decided that we were moving here. And the only other cancer hospital I'd been to in the US was the Mayo Clinic for a second opinion from our wonderfully prestigious Hong Kong hospital. So my sweet oncologist here is a cancer survivor himself. And I thought it might be sympathetic <laughs> to people with cancer and he fatly refuses to consider off-label medications and i bring him research all the time he knows our documentary he'd seen the trailer and it was just this week that i had my six month checkup with him and he constantly is amazed that I'm alive. I feel like I really disappoint him sometimes by being alive. <laughs> and this time he's like, I, I don't know. And I ask him, are these, you know, just, I know my results aren't traditional or typical, but just to remind him of that, he has to look up like, God, it's been four years, four and a half years. And I'm like, metformin, this one is so well documented. About half of oncologists will revive it. And he literally told us, what did he tell us? Uh, you know, you go. You it's against my beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I have to also feel that it's going to be good for you. Um, I was like, well, yeah. I feel like it's good for me. Isn't it more important that I feel it's good for me? And this actually, are you done? Yeah. I was going to say this is my personal story and there's oh. more. Yeah. I was going to just say that this, what Maggie's describing is a dilemma that a lot of people that have cancer have, right? It's like you, your, your oncologist is not on board with this, uh, you know, sort of metabolic, any kind of metabolic therapy or anything that's outside the box. Right. And so there's kind of two ways you can go about that is one, you can just try and find another oncologist. If you have the resources to do that, great, you know, like more power to you, but there are, you know, you could be in this position where you don't really have a lot of choices because of your insurance. Right. And so you can do, this is what Maggie, 
Maggie's done is so she's got, you know, her sort of traditional oncologist and mostly what she does there is she just gets the scans and, um, you know, like PET scans or CT scans. Um, but she sort of has another oncologist that's like a more integrative oncologist on the side. And that's the person that can prescribe her the off label drugs um, and, you know, sort of talk her through. And, you know, uh, Maggie knows so much. It's a lot of times Maggie you know, discussing, you know, with, with them, uh, what's, what a metabolic therapy is, but this is another way to, to work it. If you're, uh, if you're struggling with your oncologist, there's kind of two different ways you could go about this. Um, I know a lot of people, you just see like, Hey, if you don't like your doctor, find another one. That's not always possible. Not in America. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, the last thing I was going to, you were talking about off label drugs. I was just going to throw out there that the reason that these are not prescribed more for cancer is because they've been approved for one use. Metformin was approved for use as a diabetic drug. So even though it, the, the, even though it's now out there, they know the profile of the drug. Basically they know if it's going to hurt you very much, if there's a lot of bad side effects and metformin is one of those drugs that has very few side effects. It's, you know, well tolerated by almost everybody that takes it. Um, but the problem is, is that, for an oncologist to prescribe that there's been no study that very let's no no trial there's been no clinical trial to prove there that there hasn't been a three stage two billion dollar clinical trial that they would need right and that will actually never happen because now that the drug isn't patentable there's no one to basically pay for the trial so it would have to be uh you know some government not the u.s government probably but some government somewhere would have to actually do this sort of a trial and then maybe it could seep its way over here. So, But it's so frustrating when I ask my oncologist, I have personally been on it for four years. Do you see it causing me harm? And they still, they still have their hands tied, I think, by the system. And in some ways, I think making claims that healing a cancer patient is against my beliefs is really more just a cover up for it's outside my control because of the system. And I want to emphasize all the time that whatever my experiences have been with some MDs, different doctors, nobody goes into medicine to hurt other people or to not help them. And I, it's just the system that we have right now that makes that very, very difficult. Yeah really frustrating a lot of doctors really don't have a lot of choices like they they have the flow chart like maggie says and they can't really deviate from that so it's you know sometimes it's fun to throw the doctors under the bus but a lot of times the doctors aren't the ones that get to make that call it's some you know mba way up in the hospital chain that makes that call you know so yeah. but the way That's that very we can fair take point. It and the way we can take advantage of that is it shouldn't be a doctor or anybody making the call for an individual. Everybody's different. Nobody knows your body like you do. And so I, I try to remember that I am the boss of my team and I know what I want because of the research I've done so I can go out and get these people to give it to me. And that's what I'm hoping that our docuseries will do is give people that feeling of empowerment that they can read the research, they can take it to metabolically informed practitioners and get what they need. Yeah. Wow. I absolutely love that. The title of the episode that we, uh, the second episode we did with Dr. Seyfried was called Treating Revenue Creating Diseases. And I hope I emphasized that enough when I did that episode. Like, no, you go back and read that like three or four more times. The cancer is a revenue generating disease. And if you it's understand the system. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the number one revenue generator for hospital systems. Yeah. So yeah. maybe we, let's go back a minute when you were talking about, the, you know, what Saverd was originally brought up about the way we treat cancer and how it focuses so much on the somatic mutation theory. And that is whack-a-mole of all these different genes. And Brad mentioned how two different people with the same cancer could have different genes. Two, one person with a cancer could have different genetics in two different tumors. Uh, it's becoming more and more evident that we're not gonna find the answer in treating these individual uh, genes when Asians. any drug will develop res resistance eventually. We need to look into a root cause and not all cancers are the same. Maybe they don't all have the same root cause, but there, there are some really broad causes like high glucose, high glutamine. Uh, sure. It's kind of like, you know, we're trying to cure cancer by just if you're driving a car and you keep getting a flat tire and it's like, okay, well, we'll give you a new tire. We'll give you a new tire, you need a new tire. And like, 
the road's just covered in nails, right? I mean, it's like, yeah. Tell them about the study that you looked up yesterday. Oh, the novel drugs? Yeah, well, so this is um, something that Seyfried probably mentioned in his, but um, it was like in the last 17 years, there had been about 100, 190, was it? Uh, oh, close to 17. This is rough memory, but it's about it's 17 years, about 200 new drugs, and uh, only a couple, what was it, five or six, had actually had any kind of... Oh, I know what it was. Uh, 200 new drugs in the uh, average life extension was 2.4 months for all 200 drugs. Then when you yeah. consider the cost of these drugs and the emotional, financial, painful, physical cost to the patients, it just doesn't make sense. If you know, you look at something like glioblastoma, where you have maybe 12 months to live without treatment, 14 with treatment, what kind of months are we getting with these drugs? It's going to leave your family impoverished, and it's just going to make the end of your life very painful. Yeah. 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 yeah it's... I kind of got the feeling, actually, uh, not the oncologist that Maggie has now, but in Hong Kong, that he was just kind of like, you know, he just wasn't offering any hope, right? He was just like, you, you know, oh, these are the drugs. Like, he was genuinely surprised, not in a, like, caring way, genuinely surprised that she was recovering and doing well, right? I mean, it, you, you could tell on his face, he was just like... He, he didn't make sense to him in his head like what was happening and, uh, and that was so weird you're like but th you're telling me to take these drugs to try and cure this thing but yet you're surprised that this is working at all yeah uh, it was but it was a surreal experience they're not to cure and they know that it's all to you know honestly the drug that i was taking lurlatinib or take still in small amounts is you develop resistance in six to eight months. It costs a little bit over 24,000 US dollars per month. And, and that's my drugs. <laughs> and I was very lucky that I got them in compassionate use in Hong Kong because they weren't approved then at the time. But when I go in and get them, they're not supposed to extend my life. <laughs> they're just supposed to make me feel better for six to eight months and cost 24 thousand us dollars a month yeah a month wow <laughs> and i can't remember who the guest was on the five minute preview that you guys did like saying that like yeah th these drugs will extend your life by a few weeks is that is that good enough is that cool like are we all gonna sit around and say that a few weeks of extending a life that's probably full of suffering anyway why would somebody want to extend it for a few weeks anyway why aren't we talking about months and years and decades like like she said i thought that was such an amazing point Miriam Kalamium, the author of Keto for Cancer, and she has a beautiful perspective on that. And she actually raised a child uh, that she adopted who had GBM. And so that's how she discovered keto. She became very close friends with Tom Seafried, and he helped to guide her in this. And she still does coaching. She's in her 70s, and she's an incredible cancer coach and speaker uh, yeah. advocating keto because she has seen firsthand how just adding a ketogenic diet can improve the efficacy of these drugs, the length of time, the survival, but most importantly, I think the quality of life. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I love that. I love that. It's always, it's always fun to talk to people who find ketogenic diets for a particular reason. It could be cancer. It could be weight loss, fat loss. It could be that they want to improve their mental clarity, but there's always something that comes along with it. Like, yeah, I was able to lose like you, Brad, 40 pounds. That's amazing. But then yeah. you don't expect yeah, that's yeah, amazing. It's even better. But but they're not expecting all these other different side benefits. So what other side benefits did you guys notice from changing your diet to a more you know ketogenic style? Right. Besides just obviously handling cancer really well and losing some extra weight. <laughs> it's besides saving my life with the cancer. It started. I yeah. did. I lost uh, fifty pounds. I was very overweight before, and it was so strange because I ate what I thought was the perfect diet. I had a healthy eating blog that was all oh cook your own food. It was whole grain you know, low lean fat, meat. lean meat, yeah. dairy, things like that. But I was still huge. And partly that was my drinking because I had a high stress job. I self-medicated with wine, things like that. So when I became healthy, I cut out any kind of drinking, I any kind of drink except for water. Just focusing on organic whole vegetables was my thing. Now we eat a little bit of very, very well-raised, sustainably harvested uh, animal products. 
And my gosh, so I dropped weight quickly. My doctors didn't think anything of it because they just assumed I was dying of cancer. It was so funny. <laughs> but I knew it was bad. I actually got a DXA scan to confirm that my bone health had improved, my muscle health had improved. I was just losing fat. And yeah, a little bit of mental clarity. But I started my whole cancer journey just thinking I had six to eight months and I wanted to use those to live well, to finally experience my body. I had spent my entire life saying, if I just get through this period, I'm going to get to a point of life where I'll be happy. And let's just, you know, finish the dishes and then I can go watch TV or finish the week and I can enjoy the weekend or finish working so I can be retired. And not having that kind of time made me realize I have to enjoy right now. I'm going to enjoy washing these dishes. And that was a huge mindset change, which oddly enough, I don't think would have happened if I hadn't started paying attention to what I'm putting in my body and really treating my body well. It made me just enjoy my life. Yeah. How about you? Um, I was going to just say like the more like sort of hard fact things is like we both feel like that's more mental clarity throughout the day right we don't have that like sort of after lunch crash like if i have it it's because I, I i go back and think i'm like wait, wait what did i just have for lunch right like something carby probably right like i sort of cheated or just you know there was I had an extra potato right which i know i'm not supposed to have any potatoes but you know every once in a while it happens right <laughs> So, um, yeah, so like this, just mental clarity, just in, in general, like I just feel healthier, right? Um, I don't know how else to describe it, just I feel better on a ketogenic diet. So uh, Maggie actually, you know, um, sometimes like she likes to say metabolically flexible. So, you know, yeah. we do have other times where we, you know, have other foods in the house. And so we're not like super hardcore all the time. Um, but I was super hardcore for the first year when I had cancer in the first six weeks or six months after I was no evidence of disease, but metabolic flexibility now is very important to me. But there are certain things that I've learned that we will never, ever have processed food ever yeah. under any circumstances. I would rather fast. We don't eat yeah. seed oils. Uh, they're just, when I talk about like cheating and metabolic health, it's having a sweet potato, having carrots in my diet for a period of time. And then I can always shuffle back because just like cancers can develop uh, resistance to certain drugs, they can also develop resistance to shutting down metabolic pathways. And the one thing that we have as humans that's so incredible is we have this metabolic flexibility where our cells can use many different sources of fuel and, you know, cancer eventually could adapt to do that, but it's just, you know, they really just want to use glucose. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, the case, I think you can chime in on this one. I'm like, I really feel like we've made a new definition of what food is and it's not good right it's not food yeah yeah no yeah. totally totally I, I, it's just so interesting like if you're new to this world you might be really surprised that this is a diet that's sustainable you're going to lose fat you're going to increase your mental capacity it's the the true natural way for a body to live hopefully our listeners kind of already key into that from listening to our episodes and how amazing ketogenic are, diets are for so many different reasons but it's 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 wonderful and, and dr seafried and i've gone back and forth on this a little bit i pressed him on this he says he would tell me like you know a ketogenic diet it's tough to maintain it's tough to do not everybody's going to do it and it's like you know what's tough having cancer and having diabetes and being 100 pounds overweight i do it by choice i don't have cancer i don't have brain issues i don't have epilepsy yet i can do a virtually zero carbohydrate diet and i find it very enjoyable i don't find it to be very difficult and i think a lot of people would just like you guys you start doing it you find wow i don't need to eat as much i don't need to snack i feel really great why wouldn't i just continue this for the rest of my life yeah and it's you know, it's hard in the beginning. Like I remember day three, looking at the pizza shop and like, oh, nobody's going to know if I have a slice. But then I think I'm taking my blood, you know, two times a day. My blood test won't lie. I have to do this for myself. And I think that's, Casey, your perspective is so beautiful of doing it for your health so that you don't ever have these chronic diseases instead of just doing it for weight loss or for whatever, but you know, doing it for you. And from the cancer perspective, I think that's, an incredibly important message for cancer patients to, to suffer or survivors, whoever they are to have is that treating yourself well is the first step. Yeah. I was going to two things like one is like, yeah, it's kind of a cancer prevention diet. I mean, we know people that are on keto just for that reason. Right. So, I mean, if any of your listeners are really, really scared of getting cancer, it's something you should look into. Um, and then the other thing is, yeah, yeah. This idea of just like, 
you know, what is food anymore, right? And just the idea that we didn't have these seed oils and things like that. So like when we decide that we're going to cheat, the cheat is still things that like you could have got 150 years ago, you know, not like a processed seed oil or, you know, things that have just been ground up into molecules, right? And then like all mixed together by a chemist, you know, it's like uh, that just doesn't, you, you start to think after a while of doing, after you've done the ketogenic diet, you start to not even consider these things as options because they're, you don't consider them food anymore. That's what I went to say. I said it's yeah, difficult to start, but it becomes very, very easy. Um, I, I don't even consider wheat, bread, pasta, any of those. They're not, they're not food. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, yeah. and you know, we all are human. Um, uh, you know, every once in a while I will break down and you know, with a friend and I have a piece of pizza or something, right? And then, man, when I come home, I'm like, oh, God, I feel terrible. Like, my body is, like, I've done it a few times now, and my body is basically letting me know, like, don't do it, right? You know, it's like... Pay the price. Exactly, yeah. It's like being hungover. Yeah, it's just like, wow. it's just not worth it. Yeah. yeah. And for me, it's never worth cheating. Like, why would I feed my cancer? Yeah, she doesn't cheat at all. But yeah, every once in a while, you know, it's just like, oh, that smells really good. I'll, I'll have a pe couple pieces of pizza. Oh, bad mistake. <laughs> bad mistake. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting to have the experience. I, I noticed this with me and my clients. You walk through the grocery store and the smells that you pick up on that used to entice you, they could be cans of paint for all I care. Like, it's not, you're right, it's not food. It's not something to be put into the body and your taste buds change like having yeah. carrots they're very very sweet having a serving of berries it can be extremely sweet and satisfying and your taste buds absolutely change after eating this way and it's it's a nice easy way to keep you on track because there's so uh, there's so few other situations that's worth feeling like garbage worth feeling hung over all the time it's just absolutely not worth it and that's a good way for people to stay on the diet yeah yeah, yeah. Or if you believe that if you went off, you would die. <laughs> That's really easy for me. Good motivator. <laughs> yeah, wow. I, yeah, I totally agree. Like our taste buds have completely changed since we started doing a ketogenic diet. I mean, the things that um, that you know people consider sweet, it's like whoa, they're way yeah. too sweet for like. I mean, her, first of all, she never has any sugar anyway. But you know, it's but like, like artificially sweet things, sure. again, people just sweeten them so much. Yeah, like a uh, art of like yogurt. Like oh my gosh, like that just doesn't even tastes like like good you know it just tastes bad so yeah but yeah you're right carrots are really sweet actually like, I mean, if, you... Almonds, if you get a really good almond yeah 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 totally wow okay so tell us a little bit about the movie what was your original idea for the project that you guys literally were born to do nobody could have done this project the same way that you guys have with your backgrounds and everything you've gone through what was your original idea and how has the project kind of morphed and transformed over time over time Oh, let me actually start. Okay. So I mentioned that I had this blog. I was doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching. Brad had, I think, mentioned a couple of times about a documentary. And it's like, I, I don't know, go get a different job. <laughs> but then I had this client contacted me from Scandinavia. She was a nutritionist. And her brother had just finished his course of conventional treatment with his conventional oncologist for GBM. And so they sent him home to die. There were no other options. But she, as a nutritionist, happened to know the power of a ketogenic diet. She knew what was going on. She tried to explain it to her brother. He didn't believe her as her sister. So she enlisted me to try to convince them, to show them the research. And we tried everything. But you can understand late stage brain cancer. You can't read in book or in scientific paper or even listen to me on a screen for hours. And that's when I realized Brad was absolutely right. We needed to make this more digestible. Um, yeah, so we wanted to just make something that the, the first we were like, well, why don't we try doing a documentary? And um, we were like, if we get a couple of key people, then we'll let's let's do it. And we were very, very fortunate that both Travis and Dr. Stayfried came on board at the very beginning. And uh, they really sort of set us up for a bunch of domino interviews after that. I feel like we um, that's how we got this great pass. So I always like to thank them at the very beginning. Um, and yeah, this idea is just that, yeah, it, that there are books on this and they're good and they're, you know, very informative, but we kept hearing from people that they're, they're still too, there's still too much science or it's still too hard to understand, or it's just still too much work. 
And for somebody who's either dealing with a cancer diagnosis or for someone who's a caregiver and is completely new to this whole world, that makes a lot of sense. So we've really taken this approach of that you can you there is some science in the documentary i don't want to you know say that it's like completely science free but the idea is to to explain the science to you in a nice simple way so that you understand it and then can make some you know hopefully some choices about what you would do with your cancer or if you're just interested in the, in the subject so um yeah the the morphing part of the of it comes into where you know we what, how much what, how much of each section were we going to tell like did, Maggie definitely wanted to make sure that we got all the treatments in there and like talked about that um, you know the off label drugs like we've talked with you and all that stuff um, keto fasting and then for me one of the books that really spoke to me was um, Travis Christopherson's tripping over the truth for me I was like well just reading Miriam's book on its own just didn't do it for me the way it did for Maggie. I was like this science and explaining it, you know, from that point of view that Travis does that really worked for me. So we kind of just sort of ended up marrying those two ideas together. And yeah, the, there was just so much information that we were hopeful that it would be you know, 90 minutes or two hours. And then it just sort of became more than that. And uh, we, it, it helps in two ways. One is that we can now break it into smaller chunks. So instead of like, you know, sitting in front and like taking all of this in, you know, you just watch 45 minutes and then, you know, watch the next 45 whenever you're ready. Um, and then, uh, well, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, but there was just, just this idea of, you know, like being able to break it up and there was just too much of it that, that, to tell in, you know, one, one movie. And I think it's a great story that, you know, we finished production in 2021. We actually packed up our car in the middle of the pandemic and went from Seattle to Boston to Tampa, Florida, back up, back down to LA, everywhere. And when we had all this footage that was so incredible, we went, took it to the Metabolic Health Summit and we showed it to most of the people who are featured in our cast, yeah. plus about 30 other doctors, practitioners, things like that to say, okay, what do we cut out now <laughs> to get it down to 90 minutes, even two hours? And the universal agreement was don't cut it. You know, give yeah. it to people like this. Everybody yeah. I talked to who got that opportunity to see it said exactly the same thing. They said it was wonderful. <laughs> and don't change a thing. <laughs> Brett did such a good day of, of wrapping the science in a really compelling story that would appeal to everyone. But I'm so grateful we get to show the actual science because, like Seyfried said in your show, when you understand and truly understand the biology of cancer, the treatments seem obvious. And that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, wow. Mm -hmm. I just agree that. The first episode that people that we just are finishing up, it's almost done. It's like couple days away it's almost done um but this first episode takes you through the sort of history of where this metabolic theory came from the metabolic theory of cancer came from so it starts with otto warburg tells about his discovery of the warburg effect and cancer taking up a lot more glucose than other cells and then it kind of we interject a lot of um fun sort of uh historical things that happened with the 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 excuse me the, the mutational theory of cancer and how that formed and then we also talk about some of the reasons that uh warburg's theories fell out of favor some of it was just like personal you know things about him so we try to make it entertaining right and talk about like sort of the the history and some of the like personal stuff so it's not just like science 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 right you kind of can let it watch over you like you're watching a ken burns type documentary and the social reasons of why you probably haven't heard of this <laughs> Yeah, and it's such so an effective important. treatment. Yeah. So important. I love that. Did you take any of your experience from Jersey Shore to kind of cut in some like reality TV style drama? In there too? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, there's, you guys had any drunken fights, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. but uh... <laughs> yes. Wow. True. Yeah. Lots of archival footage, actually. Um, uh, Very and, cool. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So this question is for each one of you. What does it mean to have gone through such a terrible experience to come out on the other side of it and now be able to share something that can literally save lives? You start. Um, I mean, I'm just really thankful to have this still in, you know, to still have my wife and uh, 
to be honest, uh, yeah, the, the once we started working on this project, it's the most fulfilling thing that I've ever done. I mean, it's like I love being in front of the computer and editing and moving people by telling a story. And this just adds an entire giant layer on top of that of saving lives, you know, um, helping people live longer. And uh, yeah, I just consider myself really lucky. I mean, it's at one point, I'm really lucky that I get to do this at the same time. Like, I wish I didn't have to, right? I <laughs> wish that this was already out there. Yeah. And for me, I've always been grateful to my cancer for helping me to live life and experience my body and experience life. But I truly am grateful for it being my purpose. I feel like I, maybe I got it for a reason. I recovered for a reason with Brad's help. And now just sharing it with other people so they know the options that are out there, whether they choose to take them or not. Yeah. Yeah, that is absolutely beautiful. What an awesome way to end this conversation. Thank you both again so much for everything that you're doing and putting this out. Tell us um, where people can go to find you and connect with you and your work and tell us what to expect with the video. Where, where can we watch it? When is it going to come out and, and how will that get distributed? Um, so you can find out more about us. Um, we have a YouTube channel, so you can go and watch clips and trailers and stuff right away. Um, it's uh, just search for Cancer Revolution, uh, Cancer Evolution, which is one R. Um, you'll find us really quick on YouTube. And then our website is Cancer Revolution. Is it dot, dot, film? dot film dot film? Sorry, it's changed once. Sorry, my bad. But yeah, Cancer Revolution dot film. And uh, there's uh, an events page on there where you can find out where we're going to be screening virtually. Um, we're still having like sort of a slow rollout right now. Unfortunately, uh, we're trying to get into some film festivals um, to kind of get, you know, a few laurels on the poster and, you know, to go through the normal film world. Get some media and press just to get this to the public, people who haven't heard of it. Exactly. And so that's going to be about the first six months of next year. There'll just be these sort of virtual events and film festivals that it'll be available about. And so on our events page on that website, you can find out all the places that it's going to be where you can see it. And then we're hoping the second half of next year, we start rolling it out in some kind of a streaming service. And again, this is just that first episode where we'll, I'm working on the second episode here starting in January. I, it's actually almost about half done. So, and we'll just continue to pump out more and more episodes um, until we have all five of them. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Well, yeah. that gives us a lot to look forward to. And again, so many lives that are going to be changed from watching it. So Brad and Maggie Jones, thank you both so much for everything that you're doing in the cancer world. It's so meaningful and it's such the highest honor to host both of you. So again, thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to be on our show today. We really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much for thank everything you, you do. Yeah, thank you. Such an honor. Thank you. And yeah. this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.